TV to work. So role of the government, here we go. Just we've done a little bit of this. So we're just going to press forward. Right? We worked out that the government was both a producer and a consumer. That the government produces goods. Okay. They consume goods. So it's possible that a government can be a producer and a consumer both at the same time. We talked about how the government also interacts with the marketplace. Right? So it puts lots of rules and regulations in there. So employment laws, consumer protection laws, environmental protection laws. We decided that monopolies were a market failure, so they might put competition laws in there, intellectual property right laws. All of these laws the government can put in place, and there can be lots of them. And as we said, different countries have got different rules and different laws that go in place. So you had a time where you posted some examples of laws in different countries. All right. Next thing I want is for you just to have a quick check, just a quick check, what was a subsidy all about again? What was a subsidy all about? Always good just to regularly refresh your understanding of the terminologies. What does it mean? What does it mean when you read that the government has spent money on a subsidy? What does it mean? Got about 30 seconds to have a go. You can ask Dr. Google if you're not sure. Okay, it's a good idea, Sean. Oh, Abu's there. Are you here, Abu? Uh, I am. Sorry, I'm late. No problem. So I just need to change the register to say that you're here. Otherwise, you would be Mark Epson. That wouldn't be nice. Hi, Mr. David. I'm here as well. I'm also late. I'm sorry. Sorry? I'm also here. I'm also late. Oh, hello. Hello. Good to hear from you. Yes, okay. No problems. I can, again, make an adjustment to the register to say that you are here. Okay, thank you. No problems at all. All right. Just like that. Just like that. All right. So, near potting. Let's have a look. Payment made by the government to individuals or firms, that's a good answer. Amount of money the government helps spend, yes, okay. Uh, money given to someone who needs it, yeah, maybe, all right. Example of a subsidy the government sponsors one company, okay. Uh, direct or indirect payments to individuals or firms, good. Government pays a company for a particular reason, yeah, okay. All right, they're a little bit light, some of your definitions. Uh, but generally speaking, they're good. Let's have a look at Emma's financial grants made to firms to lower their cost of production and lower prices. That's really good, Emma. All right? Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I know they've probably come up with the word grants on in, on the Dr. Google. Maybe um, I want to try and avoid using the word grants uh, if possible. But uh, payment would be a better term to use uh, to lower the cost of production or to lower. Yes, that's absolutely right, Emma. So. Best answer, there it is, well done. All right, let's see, payment made by, yes, good. Good Harshna, amount of money, so you've got money in there. All right, so we want to avoid using the word money. We want to say uh, a payment, which the government can spend to help companies, yes. Money given to someone who needs it. Okay, so it's about the government. Uh, in this context, and a payment that the government makes to a business or an individual. Potentially, they could. They could actually subsidize consumers. That, that's entirely possible. Right? And it's not always as common, but it is possible. Okay. Yes, good. Sponsors is probably, you know, um, 
gives them a payment as opposed to sponsor. But yes, absolutely right, Hong. Direct or indirect payments to individuals or firms. Yes, that's okay. Yes, all right, okay. Now, oh, here we go. This is a challenge. This is from a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, what is the difference between, apparently it's between, not between, uh, an indirect tax and a direct tax? And, and can you come up with examples of an indirect tax and a direct tax? Ready and go. Direct taxes and indirect taxes. What does it mean? You can ask Dr. Google if you are stuck. That's what he's there for. I say he, that sounds very genderist. Could equally be a she. Here we go, direct taxes, indirect taxes, and examples. Okay, there we go, direct tax, indirect tax. Yes. Well done. Um, that's exactly right. And very good examples too. Well done. And not only that, they're examples that because we live in Malaysia, they are ones that, you know, we see, we interact with. So they're probably examples that you might be familiar with. And it's always good to have examples that are familiar to you. So whether it's the country or whether it's the actual specific example, so then you remember it. it, becomes a bit easier to store in the brain. Well done, Chan Lee. Well done. That's fantastic effort. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Good. Yes, good. 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 All right, yep, so a direct tax is one that's taken off your salary and paid directly to the government. An indirect tax is going to be passed on by another person. So like the sales taxes, like the GSTs. That's a bit of cane. Yes. Fantastic, cane. That's absolutely right. And good use of the word levied. It's not a word that we commonly come across. Uh, levied is, is a word that you'd use to uh, describe something that has been put on something. Right? So you put the, co the cost of the tax onto the goods and services. So the word levied means they've put the tax on. Good. 
Thanks a lot. Yes, fantastic. All right, team. Now, um, GST or goods and services tax, uh, that's one that is quite familiar to us because we have that in Malaysia. Uh, if you've traveled to the UK, then VAT or value added tax, that's one that's potentially quite familiar. And it's also quite familiar in the sense that it's actually in your textbooks more often than not when they are talking about indirect taxes. Because your syllabus is based in the UK, it's a UK-based syllabus, they more often than not talk about UK-based things. All right, so VAT is the same as GST. All right, it's just in the UK. Mm -hmm. So some countries can call them different things, but they are essentially indirect taxes, consumption taxes, Right. Or you could have, as you talked about very aptly, income taxes, which are direct taxes, and corporate taxes, or basically the tax on the profits that a business earns, corporation tax, corporate tax. Okay. All right. Fantastic rock star sort of jewel. Now, we need to think very carefully about the roles of the government. My favorite one, of course, is the chicken roll. Chick. No, have I done that joke with you already? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, no, chicken roll. Best chicken roll. You get the roll, you have the chicken in it, then you put mashed potato in it, then, all right, tomato sauce and mayonnaise. Oh, good. And if you're really wanting to up the up the culinary level, small, very small, thinly sliced potato in there as well. Then, if you're wanting to up the culinary level again, you crunch up some potato chips on the top. Oh, good stuff. Maybe some cheese. Good stuff. Yeah. Not not appealing at all. No, Abu. Not a fan of the chicken roll. Good. Used to get them all the time in New Zealand. That's why I, I like them. Chicken rolls. The rolls of the government. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five rolls. Now, what I've done here is I've put visual illustrations to indicate what might be a possible role, or when I say role, job, objective, goal. What is it that the government is supposed to do? So when we elect these people, what do we want them to do? All right. So these images that you see are also in the slides. These images that you see are representing the roles that we think that the government should be doing. So now in the chat function, what I'd like you to do is to see if you can come up with just one. Figure out what one of them means. See if you can work it out. They're visual. The idea is it's supposed to, because you're all visual learners. All right, so maybe you can look at them and think as to what role of the government that, that picture might represent. And into the chat, go. Grow the economy, fantastic. Yes, indeed, Abu. All right, they, one of their roles needs to be about growing the economy. Yes. All right, reducing unemployment, good. Yes, full employment, well done. What else? What else do you see in the pictures? Some of them are quite tricky, got to say. All right, so we've got growing the economy. We've got, oh, well done, Emma. Price stability, fantastic. Rock stars today, I tell you. Yes, indeed. Price stability. We want the prices to be stable. We don't want them going whoosh up like a rocket. We also don't want them going whoosh down like a roller coaster. Balance of power between government and corporations. Well, that would be a good idea uh, and certainly something that we could look at with regards to the government and what they should do. Providing security, providing health care. All right, maybe, yes, indeed, we could think about those as roles of the government, but they're not necessarily represented in the images. So if we have a look at those images. All right. Uh, so we've got, here we go, economic growth. 
got about employment. We've got about stable prices here. So we've got this one and this one to, to figure out. Right, so the one with the scales to figure out and then the one with the seesaw to figure out. So what did the scales one mean? And what does the seesaw one mean? What are we thinking? You've done really well with the others. Trying desperately not to get hiccups. Yes, indeed. Well done, Abu. It is labeled balance of payments. That's absolutely right. So what they're doing there, that particular uh, role, goal, aim, objective of the government is about trying to balance the balance of payments. So all of the payments that we make for trade, we want to try potentially to balance those so that we're not spending too much on our imports and we're not over over earning on our exports so that's the scales what about the seesaw anybody figured out the seesaw there's a bit of a clue again in the image what do we think it means one that's really quite needed in the world today it's you oh, you're so close there we go emma well done okay you guys are rock stars today income redistribution yes absolutely right I know it was a bit of an obscure image, right? But the idea here is that the person in red has all the income in comparison to all of these people here in blue. So the government might be wanting to rebalance the income levels, right? And we've talked about this sort of idea before. We've talked about, you know, people like Jeff Bezos who made billions of dollars during the pandemic himself personally, billions of dollars. Right? We've talked about how there are some people like, um, well, like Jeff Bezos, I guess, uh, who are the wealthiest people basically in the history of the world. Right? There hasn't been anybody with more wealth than that. And that if you were to add up the Jeff Bezos's and the Elon Musk's and the uh, Microsoft Bill Gates, right? Uh, you add them all up, the Warren Buffetts, you put them all together, and they've got more mon money combined than probably half the world's population. So yes, redistributing right, could potentially be one of our goals for the government. And we said this before, is that it's, it's up to you. You decide what the government is supposed to do. You might be really, really keen on this idea about employment. You want people to be employed. So then you tell the government, we want you to employ people. You might be really, really keen about trying to keep prices stable, right? So that's your goal. That's the government has to do that. And whatever it is that you are personally really passionate about, you elect governments based on that. And we see that. We see that all the time around the world, okay? We see America, who was very keen, believe it or not, um, the previous president in America, who shall remain nameless, he was very keen on this idea about balancing the balance of trade. He actually didn't understand the economics of it, even though he loudly proclaimed that he did, and he got it completely wrong. Um, but that's one of the things he was very keen on. Wasn't so keen on this one. All right? Was quite keen on this one. Okay. All right, now, team. So what is it that you are interested in? Which role of the government do you think is the most important? Is it about trade deficits? Is it about fair distributions of income? Is it about unemployment? Is it about stable prices? What is it, All right? So you got A, B, C, D, it's a poll, you pick based on your particular value position, what you think. Mr. Piers, you can jump in here as well if you want. Have a go. What do you think? What should be the most important thing that the government does? At some point, you're gonna be electing them. These are the people who represent you. What do you think they should be doing? Thank you for a few answers for B already. All right. An answer for A about stable prices. More answers for B. All right, man, last slot, have a go. What do you think? 
it's it's just your opinion it's not a right or wrong answer it's just your opinion do you think the government should be involved with regards to unemployment uh, low and stable prices is that the most important thing uh, reduce trade deficits or fair distributions of income what do you think would be the most important thing no? okay so by far if we look at it see fair and equitable distribution well done okay Sean that's good uh, if we have a look at it 80 or well, basically 82 percent let's share that with you about 82 percent of all of you think unemployment is the biggest thing governments need to do deal with right and given the current circumstances I can you know I can see why you know maybe different times in history they might have been concerned with other things and there might still be Right. But yes, well done, team. Fantastic. Now, here we go. Let's have a look at those objectives again. Let's a little bit more detail. Now, I've added a couple here just because I wanted to. Um, so let's have a look. Economic growth, that was what we were talking about. Now, looking at them, you've, you've got to understand that the language that we're using is going to be quite vague. All right? And it's going to be deliberately vague. All right? So what we want for economic growth is we want high and sustainable economic growth. So it's not just that we want economic growth, it's that we want economic growth to be sustainable, which means ongoing. We want it to keep going. Okay? We don't want economic, yay, economic growth. Boom. We don't want that. Okay. All right. And similarly here, we want low inflation right? or stable prices, but we haven't actually defined what that means. So we as a country need to decide what we mean by stable prices or low inflation. So if we take the UK as an example, they talk about inflation as being 2% plus or minus 1, all right, as being considered stable or low. And that's what they want to aim for. Now, of course, it is, it is, it looks specific. No, it's 2%, 2%, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's a range because it's plus or minus 1. So one to three percent so between that range is their target and anywhere within that range they would accept as being low inflation and similarly again if we want to solve unemployment if we want to reduce unemployment if we want to bring about the idea of full employment we need to know what that actually is what does low unemployment mean well again if you're looking at the UK the government tends to, and it doesn't always, but it tends to suggest that 3% of unemployment is considered full employment. So even though we're using the idea of full employment, we're not saying everybody has a job. We're just saying that that is the smallest amount of unemployment we can possibly get. Not that everybody has a job which is, you know, one of those sort of misunderstandings, I guess, that people have with regards to economics and how we use phrases. So when we say full employment, we are actually saying that there is still a level of unemployment, but it's just really, really low. It's the lowest we can possibly get it. Then uh, a satisfactory balance to payment. So again, it's that scales. Remember the, the scales one that uh, Abu pointed out, okay? That's about your exports and your imports. So trying to reduce the level of deficits on your current account. Now, some countries got very large deficits in their current accounts. Right? America is one, okay? Uh, a, a big deficit with many countries, particularly China, uh, but also some other countries as well. Right? And that was the, the issue that the former uh, president of the United States was quite hot on. He was very upset about the deficit on the balance of payments with China. Right? And it was all China's fault. Okay? And the economics of that is completely wrong. But in any case, uh, we might also add, just as an addition, we might add about reducing the level of government borrowing. Right? So some governments, because as you saw when you did the table, they're actually in a state of deficit. Now, the problem with that is, as you understand, if you've borrowed money from someone, never, right, you tend to need to pay it back, okay? So if you don't borrow money from anybody, then you don't have to pay it back. So therefore, most governments, if they're in deficit, are actually going to be borrowing money in order to keep going, 
Now, it might be that they're borrowing money from themselves, like from the domestic population of the country. Right? Or it might be that they're borrowing the money from overseas countries, like, say, the China and the Japan and the South Korea and whoever else who actually has money, Germany, right? Um, and that enables them to continue to run their deficit. But in essence, all deficits need to be paid, right? So that's something to consider. So we might have that as an additional goal. The exchange rate, again, we might add that as an additional goal. We might want it to be stable, right? One of the reasons why, as we're going to discover later, later, um, is that some countries are very dependent on trade, right? New Zealand, for example, is a very export-dependent country. We need um, to do well in our exporting. So say, for example, like other countries like Thailand, uh, New Zealand's tourism has absolutely been almost completely wiped out other than domestic tourism um, and that's caused a big issue with regards to the economy at the moment so the exchange rate can have an effect on that uh, minimizing inequality that's that idea about trying to balance out the income distribution right to avoid high inequality and again it's very vague right so is trying to make it fairer, right? And again, what does it mean to be fair? Okay, is it fair that Jeff Bezos has all that money and you don't, right? Um, is it fair that some people have next to nothing and struggle just to survive and we are relatively wealthy in comparison, right? So, but what is the fair distribution? Should we have everybody earning exactly the same amount of income? You know, that that's the question. And also these days we want to protect the environment. So we might actually add that as a possible goal for the government as well. So even though we've got those key ones that we think about, growth, uh, trade balance, stable prices, income distribution, right? Just those key ones, right? We can also add extras and it depends on, as said, the philosophy, the, the values of the people who are electing the government. Right? So if you all of a sudden, if we decide that the environment, vital, let's protect the environment, we need the government to solve this particular problem, then we might elect politicians who then put that as an objective. All right, next slide, here we go. Do the goals conflict with each other? Short answer, yes. All right, are they in conflict? Do they... Uh, because you have one particular objective, is it possible that it's going to clash, conflict, cause a trade-off with any other particular objective? And the answer is yes, absolutely they do. So let's have a look at some of them. Let's roll through them. Here we go. Economic growth clashes with inflation. So if your goal is to create economic growth, one of the side effects, one of the trade-offs, one of the conflicts to that might be that you actually end up creating inflation. If your goal is to reduce unemployment, similarly with economic growth, you're gonna end up having a trade-off potentially with inflation. If your goal is to, again, economic growth, you might end up with an impact on your current account balance. Right? That isn't what you want. Uh, similarly here, budget deficits, if that's what you're wanting to control for, you might have an issue with economic growth. And similarly, again, economic growth, let's grow the economy, but there's gonna be a conflict with environmental protections. So even though we say these are the things we want, it may not be possible to get it all at the same time. So it might be that we need to target our goals and objectives and try and say, we're gonna focus on economic growth and unemployment now and worry about inflation later all right particularly at the moment that's what a lot of countries are doing they aren't worried about inflation at the moment there might be a few people who start talking about it but at the moment the big thing other than obviously health care etc but the big thing that governments will be thinking about is unemployment and economic growth those will be their big macroeconomic objectives outside of the you know the, the pandemic related health care etc do they conflict with each other absolutely they do 
Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm wanting you to pick any two goals and then have a go at explaining why they might conflict with each other. Why there might be a trade-off between them. There you go. Any two goals and why they might conflict with each other. Good work, Lancelot. Good idea. Oh, well done, Charlie. That's fantastic. Oh, fantastic. Huh? My word, these are rock star level answers. Well done. All right, another few minutes. Here we go. So look here, Emma. Oh, very good, Emma. Well done. Yeah, good work, Arena. Uh, yes, absolutely right. <clears throat> So that's the level, that's the depth then. Should you get this <clears throat> in an exam, you're looking at four to six marks potentially, probably more four marks, right? To explain two goals that may conflict with each other. It is a specific bullet point in your syllabus. And it's one of those sort of quirky ones where you can actually see the analysis. Um, and all you need to do is exactly what you've done. Right, is just link the two together and explain how, they, uh, how there is a trade-off between them. Right, so say for example this one. Right. Uh, economic growth versus the environment. Economic growth may involve an increase in production of goods and services. Some of those goods and services potentially involve materials such as fossil fuels, which have an impact on the environment. Environmental goals would have to be about reducing pollution, putting taxes on the use of fossil fuels is one example of a certain way that they could hinder economic growth. Fantastic, Charlie. Very, very good. All right. So they conflict with each other. That's really good. Well done, team. 
Now, here we go. Because we've got those as goals and objectives, right, of the government, the roles that we need them to play, we need tools that they have to fix those problems. Right? So unemployment, how do we fix it? We need tools to fix it. Kind of like it's a car and we're a mechanic. We know what the problem is. We need the tools to fix it. So, again, apologies for the terminology here, but we've got monetary policy. Now, you can probably see the word money in there, right? And monetary policy is going to be anything to do with the money supply and interest rates, and they will be used by the central banks in order to pursue objectives such as price stability and maximum employment. All right now, that's the, the the idea of using these tools is that we're going to be trying to fix those problems. All right, like the idea that there is unstable prices or there is uh, a level of unemployment that we're not happy with. So maybe we could use interest rates, for example, right, to improve the level of economic growth, therefore jobs, etc., in the economy. So maybe we could decrease the level of interest rates. Well, we then run into a problem because as a number of countries around the world have discovered, they decrease the level of interest rates down to zero and how much lower than zero can they go? So there are actually some countries in the world, not many, but there are some who've actually got negative interest rates. And that's kind of the, the weirdness of the system. Up until now, we've kind of just assumed that zero was a limit that you couldn't go below zero, but turns out you can, right? And a negative interest rate is going to essentially mean that the bank is going to basically charge you for saving money, like a tax, in a way. And whilst that kind of does work, it, it really does show a limit to that particular tool uh, as to whether it can be effectively used, particularly in this current situation that we're in, right? Most countries around the world have pretty much run the limit to what they can do with regards to monetary policy. So then the other tool that we could possibly use is this one. It's got a really awkward name, fiscal policy. Okay, And that's all about what you were doing before with your table. And it's looking at the tax revenue a government gets and their spending. So it's all about tax and spend. Right? So it's the policies that the government has to do with taxation and the policies that they have to do with spending. So if they increase taxes, or if they decrease taxes, if they increase spending or decrease spending, that's essentially what fiscal policy is all about. But obviously, as you figure out, the government can spend all sorts of money on all sorts of different projects. The government can also tax all sorts of different people in all sorts of different ways. Right? And then they can be quite complicated, some of those taxes. You know, and we're gonna look at some of them, right? But the idea there is taxation and spending. So again, it's that idea that if you were to say unemployment is the main problem that we'd said before, so maybe we could decrease taxes. Well, yes, but how low can you decrease taxes to before it becomes a problem for the government? Right? Well, how about the government increases its spending? Yes, we can do that and let's increase our spending. But as you saw in your table, you increase your spending and you might actually run the risk of running deficits, right? which then can become a bit of a problem maybe further down the line. Right? So with each decision that we make for the government, we can then say, however, this might lead to. Right? And even let's fix unemployment, yay, we're gonna do uh, monetary policy, we're gonna do fiscal policy, but as we saw, there's a trade-off potentially that we solve unemployment and we cause inflation. So even that is a however. So when you're considering these tools, you are thinking very much those whether questions, whether monetary policy will fix this or not, whether this will fix that problem, or, you know, that sort of an approach. So it could be up to eight marks. All right? So you need lots of those ideas about it could work in this situation, but maybe not that one. It works, but then there's a trade-off with this other policy. Okay. 
So these are all tools, like the mechanic with the car. So we're going to literally talk about these tools as potentially being like an accelerator and a brake. So you're worried about there not being enough employment, not enough jobs. So you're going to put your foot on the accelerator of the car to try and push it, right? make it grow. Okay? Uh, you're worried that there's too much growth causing too much inflation. So you're going to put your foot on the brake and hopefully reduce that level. So those are the tools, the two main tools that we're going to use. All right, what was monetary policy again? Last thing for the day. Define monetary policy. Where you go? What was monetary policy again? You can ask Dr. Google if you need. He's there to help. Yeah, okay. That's good, Emma. Good work, Sean Lee. Yes. Yes, that's the goal of monetary policy, but what is monetary policy actually? What are you doing? Yes, good, Kane. What are you actually doing? Emma had a really good answer. Right. Government policy, it's about the money supply. It's also the interest rates as well. But it's controlling the amount of money in the economy, either through the actual physical quantity of money or through the interest rates that people have when they are you know, using their credit cards or, or borrowing money in order to spend. By influencing either of those two, they're able to try and create a situation where there's more consumption or less consumption, more investment or less investment, and therefore more growth or potentially less growth, depending on whether they're wanting to control inflation or whether they're wanting to control uh, unemployment and growth. So that's a really good one from Emma. Well done. Oh, increases liquidity to create it. Oh, goodness me. That's very fancy there, Harshner. Well done. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's very academic uh, and probably confusing to a whole lot of people, the word liquidity. Uh, liquidity is a fancy word for the ability to use money. All right. So I'll give you an example. We've talked a bit about money and what money is. Right? Let me go back a little while. And we said that a long, long time ago, people used to use, remember they used to use shells as money, and they used to use stones as money. Well, these days, using shells and stones to buy goods and services would be quite difficult to do. Right? You might have a famous painting in your house that you think you could use to you know, trade that for a loaf of bread, but that would be difficult to do, right? not easy to do. Right? So that's about the degree of liquidity of it. How liquid is it? Right? So money, cash, physical notes and coins are the most liquid because they're the easiest to use. So that's where this idea comes from. In fact, you may have even heard people who, you know, have you, can, um, are you able to afford this? No, I'm not very liquid at the moment. Right? Uh, it may be that some people have a whole lot of their money, but they have it tied up in assets like houses and cars and 
I don't know, private planes, who knows. So they actually don't have a lot of cash on hand in order to buy things. Right? So liquidity is about the ease of use of money. So when the government makes it easier to use money, potentially there could be more economic growth or they make it more difficult to use money that might actually reduce inflation. So that's what that one's all about, Arjuna. But good use of the term liquidity, not word. Use that in an exam and you'll impress the examiner. Right, well done, team. Now I'm going to stop sharing. Jump back to the meat. Now, team, well done. There was a lot of terminology that you learned today, and you've also seen that analysis side that you're going to need to get to, all right? So the idea of written expression is going to be important as we go forward. <coughs> but Fleming. Now, what you need to consider is we're going to be doing this virtual thing probably right, right the way through to June. All right, that's the latest I have heard. Mr. Griffith sent an email out the other day that we are more than likely to be doing the virtual learning through until June, which is absolutely fine. All right, you're getting very good at it now. So that's what we are looking at. All right, so we need to just make sure that we review the terminologies, we ask the questions, because it's not the same as being face-to-face. -face. Um, do remember, you can always email me. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, please do review the terminology that we've looked at today because we're going to continue on that particular path. Otherwise, as we'd say in the land of my birth, hey, corn it up, which means goodbye for now. Please have a break, move away from the screen, get some fresh air if possible, um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. David. Thank, Thank you. you. See you soon. Take care. See you. See you.